of Pediatric Gastroenterology and the Director of the Gastrointestinal Motility and Functional Bowel Disorders Program at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Tipnis, I got to know back when he was a resident in general pediatrics as well as a fellow in pediatric gastroenterology here at UCSD and gained uh, extensive additional training in gastrointestinal motility and functional bowel disorders uh, subsequently at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He uh, came back to San Diego for a few years and then again in the past year has become the division chief of the University of Mississippi. It is a great honor and pleasure to have Neil here today. If anyone can make bowel movements sound interesting, this guy can. So, uh, and behind, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and reach for one of uh, our little tokens of appreciation for being here, thanks to the Sulpizio family. And I hope you and Jenny can enjoy that on your trip out here. So thanks, Neil. All right, thanks, Paul, for those uh, kind words. It's always great to be back at this uh, conference. It was uh, eight years ago when we were meeting uh, down in Mission Valley that I attended the first conference, and we were able to tie that in with a little bit of research, so it was a lot of fun. Um, but I'm going to switch up some gears now. I've been talking about the lower end for the last few conferences, so now we'll bring it back up to the upper end, which to me is the, the sexier end of the GI tract, uh, and talk about reflux disease, which is an in-and-out process. All right, so the objectives of our talk today is to talk about the, the various symptoms of, of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Then we'll spend some time uh, talking about why does uh, reflux disease happen, how we evaluate reflux disease if an evaluation is necessary, and then uh, how we treat patients with uh, GERD-related symptoms. So let's start with the case. This, this may sound familiar to some of you. It's the case of the crying baby. So we have a four-month-old male uh, baby who was a little bit premature, a few weeks premature, breastfed, growing well, who has frequent regurgitation following meals. He's pretty restless. He uh, backs his, uh, or arches his back with meals, and he regurgitates quite often after he eats. And he's irritable, and the parents say that he's gassy all the time. He poops with a little bit of uh, difficulty, he grunts, he strains, and the parents are at their wit's end because of crying. So who's, who's had that baby? I think a good number of us have had that baby. I've had that baby. Um, so what's the diagnosis? And, and these are all sort of the, the, the diagnoses that you know, a, a pediatrician and a GI doctor will, will think about as we're evaluating patients with these symptoms. So reflux disease, urinary tract infections, colic, cow's milk protein uh, allergy or intolerance, and then we always worry about non-accidental trauma. You know, did something happen to, uh, to that child? And of course, because this is a talk on reflux, the answer would be A. And so then the question is, what do you do next? Do you give a trial of an acid blocker? Do you thicken the feeds? Do you change positions after feeding? Uh, do we change the type of milk or, 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 or the composition of the breast milk uh, for the baby, or do nothing more than reassurance? And, in reality, we may end up trying all of these things along the way as we wait for the baby to get older and mature and the natural process of reflux goes away. So let's look at reflux in a little bit greater detail. So when we look at the epidemiology of reflux in the child, we see that, first of all, reflux is pretty common. Up to 70% of infants at some point uh, will have at least one episode of, of reflux per day that's noted by a parent. And um, reflux actually increases in frequency where about half of the infants are having some type of reflux uh, during the zero to three months of age. By four to six months of age, it peaks where, you know, again, up to 70% of the children are having uh, some regurgitation that's notable by parents every day. And then gradually, as the, the children get older, we'll see that the reflux frequency decreases to where by about a year of age, and, and you have to adjust for prematurity if your child is premature, it's really a, a minimal uh, percentage of individuals that have, have reflux. I'm going to turn the pointer on here. Okay. 
So let's look at what uh, causes reflux disease. And so the main reason that children have a reflux event is uh, something called a transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, or a TLESR. And what that is, is the valve between the stomach and the esophagus periodically during the day will relax, the pressure will decrease in that valve, and just as things move from high pressure to low pressure, um, contents in the stomach, when that pressure in that valve is low, will move back up from the stomach into the esophagus. But this valve will open up at other times during the day as well when we swallow. Um, that valve opens up to allow food to go down. Um, and uh, uh, also um, in, in, effort, in an effort to clear reflux, that valve will open up to allow things to come down. But this is by and far this most common mechanism, whether it's a child or an adult uh, for having reflux. The difference for infants versus children versus adults is this valve is opening up about four times an hour in an adult, and a child is opening up anywhere from five to 11 times an hour, and an infant it can be opening up as often as 17 times an hour. So that's 17 opportunities every hour for that infant to have reflux. Now, most children don't reflux that often. If they reflux, it's gonna be right after a meal, and then as the stomach empties out, then you'll see that that reflux frequency will, will go down. Some of the other factors for infants that make them more at risk for reflux, their esophagus is shorter, and it's also smaller in diameter compared to an adult, so they have less capacitance, so there's less room for the esophagus to absorb that refluxate coming back up from the stomach. And also, infants are drinking a significantly more amount of fluid compared to an adult. So if we were to translate the amount of formula, say if you're drinking three ounces of formula every three to four hours, that would be the equivalent of an adult drinking seven liters of milk. So almost two gallons of milk every day. So that would make me reflux too. <laughs> and then the last factor that plays into uh, to effect is, is the effects of gravity. So, um, you know, an adult, we're sitting up more, we're upright uh, during a great part of the day, especially during around the times that we've eaten. In an infant, usually they eat, you lay them down, and gravity allows that contents to spill over um, when they do regurgitate as well. So those are the reasons why, why infants are particularly more prone to regurgitation. And so then the question is, what makes somebody that has a normal amount of regurgitation, because again, it can happen up to 17 times an hour, um, go from having simple regurgitation to disease? And that's what we'll get into later on uh, in the talk. So what are the signs and symptoms of, of uh, reflux disease? And so with reflux disease, there's a whole laundry list of symptoms that are there. Certainly the most obvious and, and evident is recurrent vomiting. Um, but, but irritability, poor weight gain, feeding refusal, uh, pulmonary symptoms such as apnea or spells where they actually have a, an acute uh, th life-threatening event um, can be a sign of reflux disease, wheezing, uh, esophageal irritation, uh, recurrent pneumonia and upper airway symptoms. These are all things that, that infants can present with uh, in reflux. As children get older and they can report their symptoms better, we start seeing more sort of traditional adult type symptoms, heartburn, abdominal pain, uh, vomiting of blood from ulceration in the esophagus, problems swallowing due to the inflammation in the esophagus causing uh, the muscle to not work well, pulmonary symptoms, and again, uh, this idea of recurrent vomiting. And I went through these two slides, so I'm gonna skip ahead here. But this looks at uh, the anatomy of uh, reflux, and again, what it shows that this is the area that we are concerned about for reflux disease, where the lower sphincter is a combination of both specialized muscle in the esophagus called the lower esophageal sphincter, and also the crural diaphragm, which is a component of the, um, the airway. And so this diaphragm helps to augment the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter to prevent reflux from happening. When you get a hiatal hernia, the stomach actually moves up into the chest more, and so you lose the, the benefit of the crural diaphragm to prevent reflux disease. And so that's why a lot of children, if they are diagnosed with a hiatal hernia, they would benefit from anti-reflux surgery to fix that, that area. And in reality, 
probably the way that anti-reflux surgery works is that um, the surgeons often will tighten up the, the, the diaphragm and then reestablish this angle of the stomach with, within the, the abdominal cavity to help prevent that valve from opening up as, as readily as it should. Unfortunately, with anti-reflux surgery, there's some crucial nerves and veins that are going through that area, and sometimes those can get injured and lead to other trouble. So that's why there, there has to be good rationale for surgery. Let me just uh, spend a, a, a moment talking about milk protein allergy and intolerance. And there are a subset of infants with vomiting that have cow's milk protein allergy intolerance. And, and blind challenges have shown that if you were to uh, expose these infants to cow's milk containing formula, switch them over to a hypoallergenic, hypoallergenic formula, and then put them back on a cow's milk formula, they'll go from having you know, significant reflux symptoms to abating those symptoms, and then with reintroduction, uh, they will get symptoms again. And so in these children, their symptoms will, will generally resolve very rapidly with a change, change to a protein hydrolysate formula. And so that's an important, important point is that uh, when you look at the types of formulas that you can choose, it's important to pick one that's truly hypoallergenic. So there are there now is a category of formulas that are partially um, hydrolyzed. Uh, so that would be Gentilese as an example, and each company has their own version of it where the, the milk proteins haven't been broken down enough to really provide you with a hypoallergenic effect. You really have to move into the extensively hydrolyzed formulas, which would be uh, Nutramagen, Alimentum, uh, Nestle has their own version of it now that's changed names twice, so I don't remember it. Uh, and uh, you know, there's also some generic versions as well now that are that are equally good, um, but are extensively hydrolyzed. So you have to use one of these extensively hydrolyzed formulas really to get an anti-reflux effect and to treat the uh, milk protein intolerance. In breastfed children, you can do uh, milk elimination diets where mom essentially goes on a, on a milk-free diet. Um, you, for some, some moms, they have to be very, very uh, careful about their milk elimination diet where they eliminate casein and whey and other milk byproducts from, from their diet. And so there's actually good information now on the Food Allergy Network um, website to, to look at that. And over the course of about three to four weeks, the breast milk will clear itself of all the milk protein um, components that are there. But again, it can take three or four weeks for that process to happen. Uh, so it is something that you have to, to really commit yourself to and, and, and uh, be consistent for about that month to see if that's going to work. You know, unfortunately, with soy-based formulas, about a third of the kids that are uh, intolerant of cow's milk will also be intolerant of soy milk. And so my practice style is to go directly to um, the protein hydrolysates to see if that works. If it does work, then you know, then then a few months down the road, you can try to challenge back with soy. Um, you know, once you've gotten good control of symptoms. Because um, again, you know, the natural history is going to be in your favor if you wait till that five to six month point to make that switch back. That uh, they're going to have a better chance of, of tolerating the soy. And the other important thing is to avoid you know, what we call the, the formula roulette, where you uh, move, uh, you know, day to day, week to week, from one formula to the next without giving really an adequate challenge with uh, a protein hydrolysate formula. Uh, in place. Again, it can take anywhere from two to four weeks to see the maximum benefit from a, from a formula change. So now let's look at what really causes symptoms in, in children. And, and this is a, a very busy slide, but it really highlights all the things that can lead to esophageal symptoms in children. So this right here is the lining of the esophagus. It's made up of these cells called epithelial cells. And these are the same cells that are actually on your skin, but they've been specialized uh, with um, uh, to help uh, um, you know, uh, buffer the, the deeper layers of the esophagus from the effects of things like acid and, and pepsin. 
But when you reflux, you expose this lining to uh, various chemical mediators, uh, hydrogen ions from acid, digestive enzymes such as pepsin and, and bile, and then potentially also allergic antigens uh, from, from milk and other things that we ingest in our, in our diet. And in susceptible children, that will break down the junctions between these cells, these tight junctions, that then allow these uh, chemical uh, uh, components of the reflux to percolate down into the deeper layers and then activate other cells, such as these include inflammatory immune cells, such as mast cells, and they can also have direct eff effects on the nerve and muscle and cause. Uh, uh, neuropathic changes and also muscle function changes through direct effect. These mast cells may turn out to be very important mediators in the genesis of symptoms in, in individuals because these release other cytokines that both uh, create, that, that recruit other cells to cause inflammation such as eosinophils that are the cells that we usually look for in either reflux or allergic esophagitis but also may play a direct role in affecting the mast cells and may play a role in further degrading the junctions between the epithelial cells uh, in, in, in the lining of the esophagus. Um, and then stress plays a role as well. So stress can actually create neurogenic inflammation. It can also um, cause these mast cells to degranulate more. So there's that psychological component that we've always been worried about uh, causing some, uh, as, as, a, as a cause of the esophageal symptoms. And both adult researchers and myself have begun to identify that uh, in patients with um, heartburn that are non-responsive to treatment for acid reflux disease and we don't find any other, uh, any other evidence of um, esophageal inflammation based on biopsies that they really may actually have an irritable bowel syndrome of the esophagus because we say the same type of motor dysfunction that you see in the lower GI tract with irritable bowel syndrome and they have symptoms that really fit propulsion issues in the esophagus itself. And then last, this can lead to dysmotility, which leads to poor clearance of refluxate when it comes up into the esophagus, and this cascade continues on and on and on. So our treatment as we move forward will start to target all these different chemicals that are involved. We may see things that change how we regulate the immune system in the GI tract, and also treatments to treat stress. Um, so we may see the use of things such as uh, SSRIs or gabapentin and other things to, that we would traditionally use to treat um, things such as functional abdominal pain to treat esophageal symptoms as, as well. But that's down the road. So let's talk about things that we can do now. So when you look at what are the treatment options uh, for ch infants and children with reflux disease and symptoms of reflux, really they, they boil down to lifestyle changes, pharmacotherapy, and potentially surgical therapy. So as far as lifestyle changes go, again, we can do things with diet. In infants, we can alter the composition of the breast milk or formula. We can do things to try to change the, the volume of the feeding that they're eating by either thickening the feeds or um, decreasing the size of the bottles and increasing the frequency of the feeding. And we can look at it a little bit um, as at sleep positioning as well. But because of the risk of SIDS, I really don't spend a lot of time talking to parents about changing sleep position other than trying to keep the children upright for you know 30 minutes to an hour after meals if, if possible. It's hard, um, especially with a young infant, to, to hold them for an hour afterwards. I've done it with three, it's hard. Um, and so, again, it's something that, that you really can't spend a lot of time you know, trying to do positioning therapy um, uh, for treatment of reflux. You know, our pharmacotherapy is, is fairly limited um, in, in what is uh, safe and effective, uh, but mainly focusing on things such as acid blockade and potentially using prokinetic medications um, as well. You know, depending on where you live in the country, you may have some geographic access to effective prokinetic agents, but most of us don't. Um, so I don't spend a lot of time talking about that as well. And surgical therapy is useful for individuals that have such severe reflux disease that it's actually life-threatening. 
So those that are getting recurrent pneumonias, those that are having you know, recurrent uh, alti or SIDS-like spells that we can you know, make a one-to-one -one association that when they have a reflux event, they have a, uh, a spell. For older children, you know, again, we can do things with dietary modification. Obviously, you know, looking at historically what are certain foods that tend to trigger more symptoms for that individual and then eliminating them is, is beneficial. People talk about acidic foods, fatty foods, um, but I think more importantly, it's the timing of the meals in relationship to laying supine that really puts you at risk for reflux. There's a very good study done um, in the VA population where they looked at the timing of the meal and the frequency of reflux symptoms. And what they found is that if you ate within two hours of going to bed, you were three times more likely to have problematic reflux than those that did not do that. So that simple timing change of meals can be helpful in the older children. Um, I'm in Mississippi, we talk about weight reduction a lot um, because many of our children are overweight, but certainly even a 5% reduction in weight or preventing you know, excessive weight increase can, can decrease your, your risk of uh, reflux. And unfortunately, um, we do have to talk to our teenagers about smoking cessation as well because that does cause those transient lower esophageal symmetry relaxations to occur more frequently and also reduces the, the tone of your lower esophageal sphincter. The pharmacotherapy is similar in, in older children as the infants now, and then again, surgical therapy for those with refractory symptoms. So looking at the algorithm um, of, of what, how I approach these individuals is that simultaneously I'll, I'll look at making lifestyle changes that make sense and then uh, proceed with a trial of uh, some type of acid blockade, um, whether it's an H2 receptor antagonist such as Zantac or Pepsid or Axid or a proton pump inhibitor, um, Omeprazole, Prevacid, Nexium. The list goes on and on. Several are approved now. And if they get better, then uh, for the infants, I'll keep them on therapy until they're around nine months of age and then think about withdrawing their therapy at that point. And for older children, I'll treat them for about three months. There's some very nice studies sh that show that it takes about three months to resolve esophagitis in children with an endoscopically proven reflux esophagitis. And at that point, I'll withdraw them from treatment. And if their symptoms come back, um, then that's the time that we think about doing more uh, diagnostic testing and at that point, if you hadn't been referred to a gastroenterologist, it would be a good time to see the gastroenterologist uh, to talk about what are the long-term implications for the, the child. And certainly, if they don't get better with these changes, then a referral to a specialist. And again, you can have the discussion about weighing the risks and benefits of additional diagnostic testing uh, for the reflux. Let me just take a couple seconds looking at some of, again, these behavioral changes. This is a, a study that was done by Sue Orenstein, you know, two decades ago almost now, looking at, uh, more than two decades ago actually, looking at uh, the effects of thickening uh, milk formula with rice cereal. So in this study, she uh, basically did a one-to-one -one thickening ratio. So for every ounce of formula, she added one ounce of rice cereal. So this thing was like cement. Um, coming out of the bottle, much thicker than we use, uh, recommend uh, now. But it did work. Um, so the orange bars are the amount of crying time, um, or, or the amount of time of, of the different symptoms uh, compared to the um, thickened formula, which is are in the green bars. So children that got um, thickened cereal, well, first of all, they had a higher calorie density formula, so they actually tended to take less formula, even though the calorie density was more. Um, they had much fewer frequency, frequency or, uh, episodes of, of uh, reflux, uh, regurgitation, compared to their unthickened uh, feedings. Their sleep time went up, so they slept longer, so parents got more rest. Um, and then their crying time did go down as well. The only caveat to this uh, issue of the crying time is that infants normally decrease their crying time as they get older. Um, so it's not clear if this was a true cause-effect relationship or in the design of the study if they got better 
um, just because it got a little bit older. And then the one slide on positioning. And so what this slide shows is the relationship between the stomach, the food contents, where the lower esophageal sphincter is in relationship to the esophagus. So when babies are lying down on their back, um, what you see here is that the food bolus is right up against the lower esophageal sphincter. And so when that valve opens up that 17 times an hour, the food is sitting right there, so you're going to be more prone to having regurgitation happening. And also when you're sitting in the, the bouncy chair or if you're sitting in the car seat, the, anatom the anatomic relationship is very similar. So here you again you see the food bolus right up against the lower esophageal sphincter. And so if that valve opens up and there's a food bolus sitting there, you're going to be more prone to having reflux happening. When you're in the prone position, that food bolus moves dependently down towards the, the base of the stomach. And so that valve is now clear. There's air sitting up there. When, you, when that valve opens up, you're more likely to belch um, and less likely to have regurgitation of, of food or, or fluids that's there. Unfortunately, your risk of SIDS increases tenfold in the prone position, so we can't make that recommendation anymore. But it's something that you'll see perhaps in the NICU setting in infants that are really, really having problematic reflux where they can monitor these infants closely to see if, um, um, you know, if they're having breathing issues, apnea, spells, but it is a way that you can treat that. Individuals have looked at right side down versus left side down positioning, and it does turn out that if you lay on your right side down, you empty your stomach faster, but that puts the food bolus up against that lower esophageal sphincter, so you're more prone to reflux. If you're on your left side down, the food bolus moves away from that valve, so you're less prone to reflux, but your stomach empties slower. So it's catch-22. Um, researchers have looked at trying right side down for 30 minutes and then flipping to left side down um, and could not find a benefit with that in these um, studies that they did with small numbers of infants, but perhaps in a larger study they might show some benefit. But it's something to think about, you know. You can have them lay on their right side for a little bit and then move them over to their left side later on while they're sleeping and see if that decreases the, the reflux that happens. Let's move on to uh, medications that we can use. So uh, these are uh, things that we can do to treat and reduce the acid. We can use antacids such as Mylanta or Malox and those buffer gastric acid. We can use H2 blockers which inhibit histamine release mediated and stimulation of gastrin, and gastrin is the main hormone that activates the proton pumps in the stomach that generate acid. And then there's the direct proton pump inhibitors, which inhibit acid secretion by ir irreversibly binding to and activating the sodium potassium ATPase pumps in the gastric parietal cells. So these are the pumps that directly churn out your hydrogen ions into your stomach and create acid. There are some prokinetics that we can use, um, erythromycin and, and, um, and the dopamine receptor antagonists are really the only two that we can get now. Um, erythromycin works on the motilin receptor in the stomach and small intestine and helps uh, generate contractions in the stomach and the small intestine to clear material through. And then your dopamine receptor antagonists such as metoclopramide and bethanicol act centrally on dopamine receptors to increase vagal nerve tone and uh, theoretically increase gastric emptying as well. Um, in that dopamine receptor antagonist category, category, there is another medication, domperidone, that you can sometimes get through compounding pharmacies. Um, traditionally, it's used to help uh, mothers lactate better, um, but it can also uh, work to increase gastric emptying. And then in the erythromycin category, there's other modal and receptor antagonists, cisapride, is the one that um, people are sad that it's no longer available in the United States, but it's available in, in other countries uh, that help uh, increase stomach emptying. Uh, yeah, there's actually a newer one that's in uh, currently approved in Europe that's in phase three study for constipation in adults that may actually make it over um, to the US uh, in three or four years that actually improves gastric emptying as well. 
So you may see some, some newer prokinetic agents come out in the, in the next few years. Some other things that, became, that can be used, alginates. Um, so this in Europe is Gaviscon. Um, here, Gaviscon does not contain alginates. Um, but again, it's something that we may be able to get access to. But, but alginates act as a raft to basically create a, um, a sponge buffer that sits on top of your food and helps bat down the food as it comes up uh, to prevent it from coming up as high in the esophagus. And then a lot of people are looking at these GABA receptor antagonists, such as baclofen, um, to decrease the frequency of those transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. There have been at least five compounds that have gone through phase two study in adults um, that are baclofen analogs. None, none of them have made it to phase three because of side effects. So you get the severe sedation side effect in the adults with the baclofen. But it is something to consider um, in patients that have severe symptoms or if they have spasticity, really maximizing the dose to try to um, decrease the frequency of the TLSRs can be helpful. Um, I do have a couple of slides on, on doses. Um, you know, uh, typically um, for uh, you know, uh, acid blockers, I like to try to maximize the dose. These are the four acid blockers that are uh, H2 receptor antagonists that are available now and have been studied in children and, and are FDA approved for use in children. And this is the list of the PPI formulations that are available for use in uh, children as well. Um, Essentially now, the FDA is requiring all the drug manufacturers to go for pediatric labeling whenever possible. And so you know, every single acid blocker that's available for adults is now available in a pediatric formulation as well. And they do work. Um, in the majority of children, um, acid blockade will relieve heartburn symptoms, epigastric pain, and also uh, the feeling of, of regurgitation uh, in children as well. So they're, they're very effective, and if you're not seeing a benefit from the acid blockers, most likely what that means, if you think about that complex slide where we talked about all the different mechanisms that are involved in reflux, it's probably not an acid-mediated process at that point, and it's time to move on and think about other things that could be causing the symptoms. So going back to our case, you know, the question is, what do we do next? And you know, I, I would go through this sort of stepwise algorithm that I that I showed, where we think about the simple things first: the position changes, uh, the, the the thickening of the feeds, changing the formula, and then allowing time. So most infants by that year of age are going to outgrow their reflux, and usually after six months of age, you're going to see significant improvement. And some, some of the, the developmental things that will follow along with that is you'll see that they'll start hitting you know, more advanced milestones. So sitting upright, developing locomotion, and that's around the time that the reflux is going to get better. Uh, so, so you'll have to look at that in, in the children to see if they're hitting those milestones or not. All right, let's move on to a second case. I'll have to go a little bit more quickly here. So this is the case of the irritating esophagus. So this is an older child now, a 15-year-old female, who's had a month of daily regurgitation, heartburn, throat clearing, can't move solid food down very well, and they complain that things get stuck up in their, their throat at their Adam's apple region. And things get worse as they get, the day goes on, particularly after lunch and dinner. And otherwise, she's pretty healthy, just a little bit of uh, rhinitis that's there. So then we'll kind of go through what's the, the diagnosis, and um, can we put constipation up there? Probably not. Um, rumination syndrome. Uh, what this is, this is a condition where individuals uh, increase their stomach pressure, and that forces regurgitant back up into the chest. And that can either be a volitional thing, um, so a behavioral issue, which is the traditional thought behind rumination syndrome, but also maybe a response to something called dyspepsia, where they have stomach discomfort, and that discomfort may be related to increased pressure in the stomach or the inability to tolerate that increased pressure. So there's only two ways to get out of the stomach, either move it through into your small intestine or move it back up into your chest. And so these individuals have maladapted 
to increase their stomach pressure to move that material back up into their chest. So it's not really a behavior I'm seeking attention by throwing up or regurgitating all the time. It's a way to try to pop off their stomach. And so the treatment approach is, is a little bit different if you can tease those two out. Reflux disease, and then there's this esophageal motor disorder called achalasia, where the, the valve between the stomach and the esophagus doesn't open up and doesn't allow things to move out. So those are some of the things that I think about when I get a patient with those symptoms. And the question is, what do you do next? And so do we try to we challenge of an acid suppressant uh, because we think it's reflux disease, make dietary changes again because we think it's reflux disease, or maybe it's that stomach dyspepsia, do we do a diagnostic test? Do I refer them to a psychologist because I think it's all in their head? Um, all of the above or none of the above? Well, it just depends on, on how things evolve. But most likely I would definitely start with, with the first. And so the problem with diagnosing reflux disease is that there's no gold standard test that we can do. A lot of times from the history and physical exam, we can get a sense of whether they're having reflux. And if they improve with empiric therapy with an acid blocker, that's the most likely diagnosis because there's not a lot of other things that's going to get better with an acid blocker besides acid reflux disease. Um, and then, um, you know, when then to start thinking about other appropriate testing methodologies to rule out other etiologies that can be contributing to the child's symptoms. So here's a list of conditions that can mimic reflux disease in, in children and adults. And the one that I want to just kind of pay, have you pay attention to is this diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. What this is is an inflammation, so the esophagitis, um, that's uh, related to an allergic process, which the eosinophils are allergy cells in the esophagus. And, and this is increasing in frequency in children and adults. And part of it is that GI doctors are better at recognizing symptoms. Uh, other specialists, such as the allergists, are also getting better at referring patients to the GI doctor. But I think just like allergies are increasing in children, it's the same for eosinophilic esophagitis since it's an allergic process, just the inherent frequency is going up. But some of the other things that we exclude with diagnostic testing, infections, um, uh, autoimmune disorders, motility disorders, and then uh, anatomic obstructions. So an upper GI test can be very helpful to detect anatomic abnormalities and help us exclude other conditions besides reflux disease that can cause similar symptoms. It's really not a good test to actually diagnose reflux disease because it has a high false positive and false negative rate. It's about 50% sensitive and specific. So, and that's because of the methodology. You're laying down, drinking barium, foul tasting, nasty stuff, and they're trying to shoot x-rays while they flip you over in different positions to look at the esophagus. So the infants are screaming, the older kids are screaming, the adults are throwing up <laughs> because it's so nasty. And so you just really can't, get, you know, if you see a reflux event during it, you just don't know if that's a real, you know, event or is this really secondary to the way that the test is done. But it is helpful to do things like rule out an abnormal twist in the intestines called malrotation. Um, this is a potentially serious condition that can lead to volvulus or a twisting of the intestines and needs a surgical repair. And many times after that surgical repair is done, then the children's reflux symptoms go away because they have the proper drainage reestablished um, within the intestines. This is an example of achalasia of the esophagus where um, material isn't flowing beyond the esophagus into the stomach due to a blockage at that lower esophageal sphincter. This is something that, again, needs a surgical repair. It's not something that I'm going to fix with medication. And once you can relieve that obstruction with surgery, um, a lot of times, you know, things will get better. And here's an example of a stricture in a patient that had a foreign body stuck in their esophagus for a period of time. Um, in, in this case, it happened to be a piece of um, film from the camera. The child ate that and got stuck there. And so that created an erosion and a uh, stricture that was there that required rotation to get that out. So luckily, we don't have film cameras anymore, so you probably don't have to worry about that as much. Um, 
but but you know again foreign bodies are something that can be retained for a long time. As far as endoscopy is concerned, some of the things that we're looking for are is degree of damage. So this is an example of uh, severe uh, erosive esophagitis in a patient with acid reflux disease. And these are the erosions that are here. This is somebody that you would definitely need to have on an acid blocker for a long period of time. Um, and it would be somebody, if they were older, you know, meaning teens, young adulthood, you would actually think about anti-reflux surgery in as well. This is an example of candida esophagitis, so uh, thrush down in the esophagus. Again, it can cause ulceration that's there, but the treatment would be different. An acid blocker wouldn't be helpful in this case, and we would need to treat them with medications to clear the thrush. And this is an example of eosinophilic esophagitis, where you see a thickened lining of the esophagus. They have these furrows uh, in the esophagus, and um, uh, this is a, an allergic process. You can maybe see some of these little pinpoint white uh, plaques that are here, and those are the actual allergy cells degranulating their contents to stimulate the um, inflammation that's there. And there are a few new tests that we can do now to actually monitor and evaluate for the acid and actually non-acid things coming up into the esophagus. This device is the Bravo device. Um, this capsule here is actually the sensor that gets clipped into the esophagus to measure the amount of reflux coming up. And the nice thing about this device is that it, there's no tube that comes out of your nose to actually connect to the recorder. It's all sent over through telemetry. So we can do longer tests. We can theoretically do more accurate tests because you're more likely to go run and play and eat and do all those things, which you wouldn't do with a tube in your nose. Um, this device here is a device that's used to measure both acid and non-acid reflux. It's, it uses the catheter, so a little tube through the nose that goes down into the esophagus, but it's the only type of technology that can measure both acid and non-acid reflux. So this is the type of test that we would do if we wanted to correlate symptoms with reflux, because half of your reflux is actually going to be non-acid reflux. Or if you're on an acid blocker and still having symptoms, we could still potentially detect reflux disease with this technology that's there. Um, the downside is that you have to put a tube in the nose. So you know, it does modify how you approach your day when you have a tube in your nose. And this device is a, a, a relatively new device that's uh, developed here by a company in San Diego where they actually put a, a pH sensor in the back of the throat. And the ENT doctors here in San Diego are using this device to try to correlate ENT symptoms with esophageal uh, acid. Um, the only limited to the, limitation to this technology right now is that we don't know what's normal for children because we can't do normal child studies. So um, maybe in a little bit of time we'll have some better use for that test. But this is what we can do with this technology. We can look at both acid and non-acid reflux. Um, this is the example of that uh, pH impedance uh, technology. And what we see here are sensors that are spread at different points in the esophagus. And depending on the direction of the flow of the signals, we can tell if you swallowed or if you refluxed. We can tell if it's air or gas that you're refluxing. And then in combination with an acid sensor, we can see if there's a drop in the acid level um, around the acid sensor, we can tell if it's acid or non-acid reflux. And the recorder has buttons that you can push to correlate with symptoms. So if there's a symptom, you can push a button, it puts a time mark there and says, okay, there was a symptom, let's see what happened around that time and see if there's symptoms. And this is an example of esophageal manometry. This is a way that we can look in, and see how well the esophagus itself is working. And we use this to exclude esophageal motor disorders. Uh, we can look at the various parts of the esophagus, the upper valve, the upper esophageal sphincter, um, the lower valve, the gastroesophageal, or sorry, the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. And this is the body of the esophagus itself, so the main part of the esophagus. This is the stomach region. So we can look at actually what's happening in the stomach at the same time. And we get these nice pretty pictures that help us put it all together. And so for our patient, in this case, what I did is we did the esophagram to make sure that there was no blockage that was normal. She did get an EGD with biopsies to make sure that we weren't dealing with the eosinophilic esophagitis or one of those other conditions. 
And then we did this 24-hour pH impedance test. And what, what that showed, which was interesting, is that every time that she swallowed, she had an acid reflux happening that was there. And that's a little unusual, but it was very consistent. And then we did this PA, that esophageal manometry test. And what we found was that whenever we saw stuff coming back up into her esophagus on the manometry, we saw that she was increasing her stomach pressure as well. So she actually was having that rumination physiology going on. And when that also happened, she also tightened up her upper esophageal sphincter to try to, that, that's your body's natural reflex, to try to prevent things from coming all the way out. And so that made that muscle really, really thick and eventually developed pain in that area. And so the way that we ended up treating her was with medications really to treat the, the pain part of what was going on in her esophagus, also what was going on in her stomach, because again, this rumination syndrome was probably a response to dyspepsia, the little bit of a feeling that she was getting before that happened. Uh, we kept her on some acid blocker because she did have a lot of acid coming up on her study with the pH impedance test. Um, and then I had her meet with the psychologist and speech therapist to work on some swallow retra retraining to get her to try to swallow more consistently and effectively rather than um, having sort of sloppy swallowing. So with those things over about a six month period she got better um, and with that and, and yeah, eventually we'll have to try to figure out why, you know, what things actually made her truly better, whether it was the medication, the behavioral therapy, or just, you know, having a lot of, you know, close follow-up. Well, thank you. That's all I have for today. Um, so I kind of took you on a whirlwind of, of things that are reflux and things that aren't. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. So, you know, to me, what, what the, some of the other things I look at is family history. So if there's a family history of reflux disease, you know, severe reflux disease with, with esophagitis, you know, any history of esophageal cancer, those would be all things that would tell me, let's, let's take a look, uh, let's, let's take a, a look um, down in the esophagus with, with an endoscopy, because ultimately it's damage that's, that's the, the sort of the driving point that's there. Right. If that looks great, then I wouldn't worry about it. Um, that's pretty invasive. It's pretty invasive, yeah. Right, and so I would, I would put that off until he's old enough that we think that, okay, he can communicate symptoms well or not. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of evidence that having reflux as an infant really puts you at risk for having severe esophageal damage as an adult. Now, there are some that, that do. There are some studies that say that adults that reflux were children that refluxed. Now, the caveat to those studies is that they were paid for by the drug companies that are invested in having you as an adult take the, 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 the drug. So, 
So I would personally, unless there's a family history that says, you know, this is somebody that's at risk of having severe, you know, sequelae as an adult, I would wait. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess while I was pregnant, I had reflux. And I mean, I was like beside myself. Sure. And I wonder with him, is it something he's just adapted to and now he just thinks it's normal to feel this way? Or, you know, like I said, he's never um, actually said anything. So we'll just yeah. kind of monitor him kind of. Yeah, because you know the, the endoscopy right now is, is invasive, pretty invasive. There's there's some newer endoscopic techniques coming out where you can swallow a pill and it'll take pictures of your esophagus going down. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite ready for prime time, especially in children. Um, but it's something that you know, five years from now, maybe. Thanks a lot. Sure. Maybe time for one last question. Yeah, we have one. We have one question via the uh, live stream. She has a three and a half month old uh, child with JS and has a, a bad battery flux and regurgitation. She has an NG tube and seems to have discomfort when we bottle feed her. She also has poor suck reflux, so we need an NG tube. She takes Zantax three times a day. Uh, we had an upper GI study done today, and she is all structurally okay, but she's been hospitalized due to possible aspiration. Uh, would the NG to add to the GERD issues? Because uh, mm -hmm. doctors keep talking about us uh, about the G2, is this the only you know, option? And her other concern is um, that she has low platelets. Okay. It's a challenging patient for sure. Um, yeah, I think that um, yeah, certainly you know you're sort of approaching this patient. Um, you know, really, the, the thing that would be concerning to me is the aspiration um, that's that's happening, and, and how severe is the aspiration that's going on. Um, you know, if it's if it's severe and there's you know severe dysphagia. Um, and it looks like something that's going to be an ongoing issue for you know more than three months. Then thinking about you know G tube and seeing how that changes the physiology is something to look at. And then the question is you know if the aspiration has been so severe that the patient's had pneumonias or alti spells, you know life threatening things. You know then do you think about anti reflux surgery? Um, I would I would. Continue to argue against acid reflux or anti-reflux surgery, because again, this may be a process of the child outgrows over time. Um, so, if there is an option to feed beyond the stomach into the small intestine, that may be a, a, a better option. Um, but it really depends on the center and how well the center is equipped to handle that that sort of feeding route. Um, you know, you know, there are some centers that can do that very well. There's other centers that can't. Um, and so depending on the center, you know, you may sway the, the doctors in your center to, to move more towards an anti-reflux surgery. I think in the interest of time, if you can maybe intercept Neil on the way out, I'm sure he'll be happy to. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely stay in the lobby for, for a few minutes and, and can take some questions there. Thanks. All right. On behalf of the Loving Research Administration Group, we want to give you another T-shirt for your collection. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. And a little gift card, just, uh, just a memento. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much. I, I've enjoyed being here and, and interacting with the group. Neil, thank you. I knew there was more to you than just stool. So. <laughs> <laughs> just drag that.